out of John chapter number 16 and beginning with verse number 7. John chapter number 16 beginning with verse number 7. Reads like this, but because, or that's verse six, number seven, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of the world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come. Amen. I, I, I want to preach on the importance of Pentecost. He will show you things to come. And I don't know, and neither does anybody else. I'm sure that it was preached during World War I that Jesus was about to come. I'm sure that it was preached in a even greater capacity around World War II that Jesus was surely about to come. And it almost, uh, Putin almost appears to be a, uh, another Stalin, if you will, from Russia, just a very ruthless, uh, merciless dictator and who knows what he's got in mind or where he's gonna stop or if he's gonna stop. I, I often wonder in our day, if he's the one that God is going to make think an evil thought and come down into Israel and, and ultimately be Ezekiel's war, which is, according to the Bible, right at the end. But none of us know that. It could be just the beginning of sorrows that Matthew talked about in Matthew 24. See that you be not troubled, for the end is not yet. He said, for there'll be wars and rumors of war. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but I know one who does. Right. The comforter, the spirit of yes. truth. Amen. It's very important that we be full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 The importance of Pentecost. Father, we thank you for your word. And I ask you, Lord God, that you'll speak to us as you have uh, all this past week through Brother Zane, we thank you so much for what was accomplished in every heart this past week of revival. And Lord, we continue to look to you. We continue to lean heavily upon you. We continue to need you to work and to move in our heart and in our life. I pray that you'll do that around these altars this morning. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And God, give us wisdom to apply your word to our heart and to our life, that we'll hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Heal those that are sick. God, I pray that you'll refill us all with this glorious gift of the baptism of the Holy Ghost this morning in our heart and in our walk with you. Grant it, we ask in Jesus' wonderful and precious name we ask. If you love him, would you say amen? amen. Few Christians today seem to realize how vitally important this experience of the baptism in the Holy Ghost is to our Christian life. The coming of the Holy Ghost was an absolute necessity in carrying out the will of God through the church in the earth. I know there's a lot of ignorance concerning the doctrine of the Holy Ghost among modern church members. If you don't believe that, you just attend a dozen different Assembly of God churches and you'll learn 
that there's a lot of ignorance concerning the doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost has been often called the unknown person of the Godhead. And if he is unknown to you, then that is a shame on our part because Christ died so that the Holy rose again and said, I'm going to pray the Father that he will send you another comforter, which is the spirit of truth, the Holy Ghost. This experience in the baptism of the Holy Ghost has been treated like an optional experience. Well, all we're in it for is to go to heaven, right? And all I got to do to go to heaven is to get saved, right? And so I don't need anything else. Wrong. Number one, you're not just in this to go to heaven. Going to heaven is one of the extreme benefits to being saved. But being saved is not our selfish agenda. That's right. That's right. Salvation is God's agenda. That's right. And salvation is his means, it's his vehicle of making Christ known in all the earth. Amen. Saving you was God's design for his will to be done in the earth. And I want to tell you, the Holy, if, if, Salvation is the vehicle, then the Holy Ghost uh, is the engine, the transmission, the fuel in the tank, the spark plug, everything that makes the vehicle go. That's what the Holy Ghost is. You got four flat tires without it. <laughs> you got no engine, no motor, no fuel without it. It can be nice. Real nice. You can buy a hundred thousand dollar vehicle, but if it won't go down the road, you I'd rather just have an old clunker to get from A to B. Listen, you you can you can rejoice and say, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven when I die. But what are you gonna do until you get there? What about this life? Is God's it for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right. If God's only agenda is to get you to heaven, save you and kill you. And let's just get on with it. <laughs> but that's not God's agenda. That's right. God's agenda is to fill this earth with the glory of God. Yes. The seraphim said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Hallelujah. How so? By the power of the Holy Ghost at work in the individual believer and as a collective body, the church. It's been treated like an optional experience for many in the church. It never should be that. Right. According to the Bible, it is standard equipment for all believers. For all who would carry out the great commission of the Lord Jesus to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, the Holy Ghost uh, must be a necessity in your life. Jesus declared that it is expedient. The word expedient means it is uh, profitable or it is uh, necessary that he should go away because going meant the coming of of the Holy Ghost. He said, if I go not away, then the Comforter will not come. The Comforter is not to overshadow Jesus, uh, but the Comforter came to highlight uh, how, how necessary, how important, uh, how awesome, powerful, and mighty Jesus is. And Jesus said, I'm going away. But the the, the, the awesomeness, the might, the power, the strength, the grace, and the glory is not going away. I'm praying the Father, he'll send you another comforter. And the works that I've done, you're going to do. Oh, I'm not a savior. But the Holy Ghost in me will point them who, uh, to Jesus who is. I'm not a healer. But the Holy Ghost in me will point them to Jesus uh, 
who is. I'm not the Holy Ghost baptizer, but the power of God through Christ in me, which is the Holy Ghost, uh, I can lay my hands on somebody and they too can experience uh, such power. Listen, the Holy Ghost uh, is a necessity in our walk with God. He said, if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. He said that in John 16, 7, the first verse of our text this morning. It'd be well to notice that Jesus Christ uh, felt that the Holy Ghost was so important, so absolutely necessary to the church that he declared, in effect, if I go not away, if I don't depart, then the Holy Ghost cannot or will not come unto you. No one who believes in Jesus Christ can justly or rightly deny the experience of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, for the Holy Ghost was sent at the request at the prayer of Jesus to the Father. I don't believe in no Holy Ghost. Uh, well, do you believe that Jesus prayed uh, not according to the will of God? Come on. Do you believe that Jesus uh, prayed in vain to the Father, send the Holy Ghost to them because they need him? Right. Look, let's, let's look at the coming of the Spirit of God. The coming of the Spirit, the descending of the Holy Ghost upon the church had a definite effect upon the world. When he came, he convicted. That's what the world, or, or the word convince. When he has come, he will convince the world of sin. Right. The word there means to convict. Yeah. Tried and convicted. You know what that means in a court, don't you? Man, he was, he was convicted. He was found guilty. Convicted of our sin means that we were tried and found guilty by the word of God, by a thrice holy God, that we were guilty of sin. The wages of sin is death. And nobody can get born again. You can't get saved until you're convicted. Nobody pleads for mercy until they've been convicted. Nobody makes that plea unless they feel the conviction of the Holy Ghost. I wish I could convince through theology, through doctrine, through learning, through skill, through training, uh, just by argument, maybe b with a ball-peen hammer. I wish I could convince everybody I know that Jesus is the Lord and that he's coming soon and that they need to get saved and that they need to do it right now. Yes. Come on. But not even uh, with a ball-peen hammer or a claw hammer, or a sledgehammer, can you convince some people that they're on the road to hell? Right. That they need God, and that they need Him desperately. It is going to take a higher power. It is going to take uh, the power of the Holy Ghost uh, in your life uh, to, to convince them, or to convict uh, them. Do you know that sometimes joy, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Holy Ghost uh, can convict somebody that has no joy. That's right, Brother Eddie. Amen. Sometimes uh, you need to be full of the Holy Ghost because you need joy. Because the world is in short supply of joy. Do you know the fruits of the Spirit of love and joy? I believe it'll give you joy when you get full of the Holy Ghost. Like Brother Zane said, you don't necessarily, or no, it wasn't Brother Zane, it was Brother Hanks. I went and heard him on Thursday. Uh, we we, we got to have worship teams and worship leaders, and we got to really work hard to convince people that Jesus is worth uh, praising and worshiping 
and being happy about. But when the Holy Ghost has come, uh, he will give you joy. Uh, uh, woo, hallelujah. You'll get excited about amazing grace. Uh, you'll get happy over he set me free. Oh, yeah. It'll make you want to clap your hands and shout glory when you hear somebody sing about the goodness of the Lord. I want to tell you, most churches around this nation need a good, fresh baptism of Holy Ghost joy. Hallelujah. Do you have more joy? Battery's on. It's still dead. There it is. Battery's, battery's on. It got muted. We have more joy. We need less black lights and strobe lights and disco lights. I just say replace all that with a good baptism in the Holy Ghost. You put a man with the Holy Ghost uh, under an oak tree yeah. in the summertime yeah. swatting uh, flies or gnats. Uh, and if he's got the Holy Ghost, he'll have joy. Yeah. I'd rather have air conditioning. Yeah. I'd rather have a, a good setting like this. Uh, but I learned during COVID. All that stuff fleeting, it's passing, uh, it can be taken away. But you better have him. You better have the spirit. The coming of the spirit definitely had an effect upon the world when he came. He convicted or convinced the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. To convict or convince is definitely a law or a legal term which simply means that he shall put to silence the adversaries of Christ and his cause. He brings to light the, the error of those who oppose him. And by so doing, the Spirit opens the heart of a man or a woman, convincing him or her, and thus convicting him or her. In this, uh, he acts in the office of a judge. Summing up the evidence, uh, the Spirit convinces or convicts of the fact of sin, the filth of sin, the folly or the error of sin, the consequences of sin. Yeah. I, I, I was thinking as I was uh, going through this message, I, I was thinking about when I first got born again. You know, he, he convinced me of sin in October of 93 on a Sunday night. At Fort Slate, Brother Tim preaching, he convinced me of sin and I was convinced that I couldn't go on in life without the Lord. I couldn't make it another day without him. I was on my way to hell and I didn't want to go there. And so I got gloriously born again. My cousin came home. He was in the military. Skippy, he's been here many times. He came home and we went to the gas station. He came out of the gas station and he had two beers. One for him, one for me. He popped the top on both of them. He started drinking his and handed me what he said was mine. I can remember putting it up to my lips and taking a very small sip and conviction came. Oh, I'm going to make somebody mad. I've had people unfriend me, block me, hate me for making just that statement that the Holy Ghost convicted me of alcohol. I didn't have a preacher sitting in the car with me saying, Thou shalt not drink. I put that bottle to my lips and I felt as guilty as guilty could be. I felt as guilty as a man who was being unfaithful on his wife ought to feel. <laughs> we rode down the road and he talked and we talked and we talked and just catching up and laughing. He looked over at me and he said, are you going to drink that beer or are you just going to nurse it all day? 
And I said, well, I just got to tell you, I got saved while he was gone, and I can't drink this. He said, well, why don't you just tell me to start with? I said, I don't know. I was afraid you wouldn't want to be around me. You wouldn't like my company anymore. I said, but I can't drink that. I just, I can't do it. <coughs> he said, well, I don't want you to do it. He got saved. Do you know that it's been next year, it'll be 30 years. Next year will be 30 years. There ain't no alcohol been in this body. Not a drop. That ain't because somebody said to me, thou shalt not drink alcohol. That's because the Holy Ghost came to convince me Jesus is coming. I ain't wanted to. I ain't wanted to. No more than a convict wants to go back into prison. Once I'm convicted and I've received the mercy and the pardon and the grace of God, I ain't never going back. Never going back. You know, it'll be the same way with drugs. I wasn't no drug addict, but did I hang out with people who did them? Did I experiment with them? Shamefully, yes. But it's been nearly 30 years since any foreign substance, drug-wise. When If I can get by without taking a Tylenol, I'll do that. I've, I've told God this. I'll give you the great position, the first, you know, if I got a headache, I'm going to ask God to take it. And if it don't, Go away. I know a Tylenol will probably help. <laughs> Somebody take a Tylenol and say, Woo, I'm healed. I said, Well, Tylenol probably kicked in, but I do, I do believe God's a healer. I'm not against medicine. I'm not against medicine. I'm not against going to the doctor. But neither am I opposed to letting God have the opportunity to heal it, to heal the body that he saved. I've sat in the waiting room just recently when I broke that toe. I sat out in the waiting room waiting to be seen by a doctor for three hours. Everybody that come by, my leg was out, my toe was sideways, and it was swollen up real big. One old boy looked at it and said, Woo-wee, that looks sore. I said, Bad sore. If you were to touch it, it'd be awful. And uh, I went in there and they looked at it and they took an x ray of it and said, That's a compound fracture. It, the, the bones, you know, broke in two. We can't touch that. You, I'm just going to wrap it in a soft cast and send you, send you to a doctor. I, they wrapped that thing in a soft cast that wasn't soft. They wet that stuff and it gets real hard like fiberglass. And man, that foot was all swole. And when that, they wrapped that cast around, I could feel every heartbeat in my toe. And as soon as I got home, I'll tell you exactly what I did. I took that baby off. Ken said, you need to keep that on. I said, why? So that I can... Feel my heart beat in my toe. This is coming off. They, they, they couldn't do nothing for me. I had to hurry up and wait. I waited. That happened on a Saturday, I think. It was Tuesday before I could see the orthopedic doc. I've waited for hours. I've waited for days. And I'm just of the opinion that if we went to an altar and waited for three hours or three days, uh, you would find out that God does answer prayer and that God can and will heal your body. He's able. But I ain't against taking medicine. And I'm not against going to the doctor. I'm just telling you as far as alcohol and drugs are concerned, I have been convicted 
convinced uh, a long time ago of sin uh, and I don't want it in me. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. In connection with the Great Commission to the church, Jesus commanded, commanded. Y'all understand that, don't you? Commanded. The word commanded and demanded are first cousins. In connection with the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Jesus commanded his disciples to tarry in the city of Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. He said in Luke 24, verses 47 through 49, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Yes. Now that ain't on me. It's on you. I can preach to you what Jesus said, but it's on you to be filled with the Spirit. It ain't on me to convince you of your need to be filled with the Spirit. Uh, Amen. God sent his son. His son died, rose again, ascended back to the Father, prayed the Father. The Holy Ghost descended. Pentecost is a given reality. It's on you to be filled with the Spirit. No skin off me. If you want to try to make it to heaven on your own, no skin off me. But you're going to find this is a hard way. Is when I, I can't live this life. Uh, it's, a, it's too hard, Pastor. I just can't do it. Uh, back to that altar over and over and over and over again. Feeling like a failure. Begging for forgiveness. Uh, tripping over the same uh, stumbling block over and over and over again. We sing victory in Jesus. Uh, I'll tell you where the victory comes. Uh, it's in the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, they left Egypt, uh, crossed Jordan uh, into Canaan. Canaan's not heaven. Canaan's victory over the enemy. Canaan's God said, I'll drive the enemy out. Canaan's a land of milk and honey, a, 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 a place uh, of the blessing, the fullness, uh, and the power of God on display. Canaan's the baptism uh, of the Holy Ghost. Uh, amen. That uh, is where you experience uh, victory and power. If you want to try to make it without it, be my guest. Because nine months uh, after I got saved, I was to the place uh, I knew I lacked something. Spinning my wheels. Sometimes you need four-wheel drive to get out of the ditch. Or a tow truck, one of the two. But you ain't getting out like it is. That's where you'll find yourself as a believer. I need power that I don't have. I need grace and victory that ain't never going to come any other way. I'm about to run a lap around this building. I feel the Holy Ghost. This Holy Ghost comes to equip us. He'll take you out of two-wheel drive and put you into four-wheel drive. He'll take you out of first gear and put you into overdrive. <laughs> In order for the disciples to carry, I'm laughing at how some of y'all are looking at me. In order for the disciples to carry out the great commission, they had to be equipped with power that only came through this <coughs> baptism in the Holy Ghost. This power and only this power would equip them or enable them to continue the ministry of Jesus Christ. For it was in the power of the Holy Ghost that Jesus uh, did everything that he done. Yep. You know, 
that the Bible said how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing all that were sick and oppressed of the devil. Did you read in, in the four Gospels where Jesus was standing in the River Jordan and the Holy Ghost in the form of a dove descended upon him and he was baptized in the power of the Holy Ghost? He never worked one miracle as, as the Messiah, as the Savior, as Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. He never worked a miracle until the power of the Holy Ghost rested on him. Why? Because he was your example in all things. If the Son of Man needed the Holy Ghost, then the church needs the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. That's Bible preaching. Amen. The scripture reveals by what power Jesus Christ carried forth his miraculous ministry. It's nonetheless important that Christians of our day, of any day, be anointed and empowered to do the will of God. Therefore, he charged those to whom he gave the great commission that they should not undertake the tremendous work of the Great Commission until they were fully equipped for the task. The worst thing I hate, I, 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 I want to beat my head against the wall if I start a job and don't have the tools to do the job. And every man in the house said, Amen. Amen. Some of us women. Some of us women. My wife's always told, you should just call somebody to, to come help you because you don't have the tools to do this. And I said, you're so right. You get so aggravated that you can't do the job because you don't have the equipment to do the job. Amen. And it's amazing that when you get those Tools, or you get the necessary equipment. Uh, you gain the power to do the job, and just like that, it gets done. And you think to yourself, I should have just uh, made sure I had it all before I got started, and then I wouldn't have been near as frustrated. That's how it is in your Christian walk. The Lord is trying to tell you, you should have just tarried like I told you to do and been endued with power and you would have been a lot less frustrated in your Christian walk. That's Bible preaching. Amen. Being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem but wait for the promise of the Father which saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. In this scripture, he didn't merely make a request to his disciples. His disciples were not merely asked if they wanted to or desired to or thought it would be best if they tarried in the upper room for the Holy Ghost, but rather he commanded, he demanded them to wait and be filled. You would have found in that upper room Mary, the mother of Jesus, among 120 who tarried there to carry out the command of Jesus. What are you doing here? You've been several days in a prayer meeting. What are you praying about? What is it you're asking the Lord to do? What is it you need to happen? We need power. We're the church. We're the vehicle of God. But if the if we're going to crank up and go anywhere, if we're going to hook on to anything and start moving down the road, we need the ignition. We need the power. We need the fire. Although the Holy Ghost had came upon her, 
the power of the highest had overshadowed her and she gave birth to the Savior of the world, it was just as important to her to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost as it was to give birth to the Savior. I've never seen that before until the Lord showed it to me. He said, that girl was highly favored that girl was chosen by God. That girl took ridicule even to the point they could have stoned her to death. But she said, let it be unto thy handmaid even as you've spoken. And she bore and gave birth to the Son of God as a virgin. And he said, yet she was in that upper room and she said to the whole world just as important as it was for Jesus to come it's just as equally important for me to be full of power ah help us Lord help us Lord help us Lord amen he didn't just make a request he said you be there until he comes. Although she gave birth to the Savior, this, this command to receive the Holy Ghost had to be obeyed on her part. Amen. If she was to receive this power, if it was necessary for her to obey this command, that she might continue to be a vessel used of God, how much more important is it for me to have this same experience in 2022? Yes. The acts of the early church were simply the acts of the Holy Ghost. If they were to be directed and fully guided by the Spirit, uh, amen, then the membership, the body, had to be baptized uh, in this power. Amen. Listen, until or unless that happened, Unbaptized Christians uh, were a rarity in the, in the early church, meaning those that uh, didn't know anything about the Holy Ghost or had never been filled with the Holy Ghost. As a matter of fact, uh, when Paul came upon 12 men that weren't full of the Holy Ghost, uh, and don't you know, you read between the lines, uh, he enters in and 12 boys are having church. And the first question that he says, have you boys ever been baptized in the Holy Ghost? Uh, it's drier than a popcorn sandwich up in here. If you don't know how dry that is, you make you a popcorn sandwich. You choke to death without a glass of water. You boys ever received the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Uh, ain't never heard of no Holy Ghost. Under what were you baptized? John's baptism. Well, John's baptism is good. That's a good beginning. John preached uh, that Jesus was coming. John preached repentance. Yeah. That you ought to repent of your sin. And that there was one coming after him, mightier than he was, the latchet of whose shoes he was unworthy to loose. Yeah. He said, Jesus is the one he preached about. And Jesus is the one that I bear witness to. And the Bible said he baptized those 12 men in the name of the Lord, meaning they got born again. Yeah. They believed on Christ. Hallelujah. Up until then, they were just do-gooders. Repent of your sin. Do right. Don't take more than's lawful to you. Be content with your wages. Be faithful to your spouse. They repented where they were wrong. But they didn't know how to be saved. He preached Christ to them. They were baptized in the name of the Lord. And he said, then John also preached about Jesus, uh, the lashing of whose shoes he's unworthy to loose. Uh, and he went on to say, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost uh, and with fire. When Jesus stepped down the river Jordan, he said, baptize me, John, so that all righteousness might be fulfilled. He said, Lord, I have need to be baptized of you. 
I've been telling these people you're going to come with Holy Ghost fire. That's what I need. Somebody said thought he was filled from his mother's womb. With the Holy Spirit he was. We all are when we get born again. But this baptism in power, this baptism in yeah. fire is a following and subsequent yeah. experience that needs to take place after you're born again. He said, I have need to be baptized of you. Amen. He said, here's what it is. Jesus wasn't being, bat or wasn't, wasn't being baptized to repent of sin, but baptism is a, sim a symbol of death. It's death to sin, death to the world, death to everything but the word of God and the will of God. He said, put me in that water when it come out. He's saying, lo, it's written on me in the volume of the book. I'm come to do thy will. I'm not Mary's boy. I'm not Joseph's boy. I'm dead to anything and anybody but the will of my father. I live to do his will. And that is the one that the Holy Ghost has come to fill. Those that are dead to their own will and alive unto God. Those are the only ones that the Holy Ghost will fill. Mercy. Kirsten, you better come help me. I don't think I'm going to get to finish. This is one of my favorite. One of my favorite doctrines of the church. Do you understand me? You can't have revival without a Holy Ghost visitation from on high. You ain't going to see people get saved without a Holy Ghost visitation from on high. You're not getting healed or getting anybody healed unless he walks into the room. Oh, my God. When it comes, there'll be joy, victory, power, and peace. That's why this is one of my favorite doctrines of the church. I wish to preach Jesus Every message and see somebody get saved, every message. But the reality is uh, until you get people to see their need uh, for this baptism in Holy Ghost power, many times uh, Jesus is limited in what he can do. Yeah. Amen. People that were not filled were a rarity in the early church. The spirit-filled life was a requirement even for a deacon. To serve in the church. Right. Acts 6 and 3. Wherefore brethren look ye out among you. Seven men of honest report. Full of the Holy Ghost. Uh, and wisdom whom we may appoint. Over this business. I've always believed. If you're going to serve in ministry. In the church. A biblical requirement is. Be filled. Amen. With the spirit. Yes. Did you read that? Like I read it. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full, full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Only one time in Bible Way's existence that I allow man we were starting that was not full of the Holy Ghost to serve in a capacity of leadership. And oh, yes, did I suffer the consequences. When a lot of money's flowing through, you get your hands on it. If them sticky fingers ain't oiled and greased by the Holy Ghost. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Seven men of honest report. There is no honesty unless he's full of the Holy Ghost. We work with a a man over in Africa, Brother Francis Nyang, one of the greatest men at the time that I knew, Brother Marshall Adcock, his church raised $15,000 to dig a well in Sudan. $15,000 to a Ugandan would be like making him a multi-millionaire. We sent $15,000, Brother Marshall's church did, but we went over there as a team and Brother Marshall put 15,000 American dollars in that man's hand for him to dig a well in Boer, Sudan. 
The plan was uh, they didn't have no drinking water. Everybody's dying, sick of cholera. We could drill a well for 15,000. People would live. They were going to build a church next to the well and a school on the other side and a community would come to the well and they would be right there at the church and right there at the Christian school. It was a wonderful plan. All except uh, that man stole that 15,000 and, and, and fled to live off of it. You can be full of the doctrine but not be full of the spirit. Your theology can be right. I believe in it. But have you received the Spirit since you believe? Or oh, you full of the Holy Ghost? If you are, you can't tell me you're honest because you don't know until you're tempted with something you ain't never had. You'd have never convinced me that man would have stole a dime. But he did. The Lord said to me, you can't even trust yourself till you've been tempted with something you ain't never had before. Something you need desperately. And, and it's laying right there, there in front of you. You're not full of the Holy Ghost. That flesh you wrapped in will take it every time. Notice the importance of the baptism in the Holy Ghost and in testimony and in service. Primary purpose of the Holy Ghost, hear me, is not just to make men speak in tongues. The purpose of speaking in tongues was to be a witness to the known world that he had indeed come and possessed this vessel. I don't know how to speak in tongues. I, don't, I barely know how to talk good English. I can't even speak in Spanish. Si, senor. Adios, amigos. Hasta la vista, baby. That's about all I got. But when my family seen me the little shy, backward, timid Eddie shout and speaking in tongues. No mistake, God has come. <laughs> Brother Zane preached on taming that tongue. He said the tongue is the smallest member. It's set on fire of hell. No wonder Jesus uh, Come to redeem a man and the, and the tongue that used to be set up fire of hell is now by divine act of God set up fire by the Holy Ghost. I've got three more points. I can't, Brother Eddie, I'm tempted to, but I can't. This message, somebody told me that message got more points than a fat man caught in a barbed wire fence. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to find a good spot and quit. <laughs> you can't preach this all in one set. I hope I preached enough. Hope I preach enough to convince you. Convince you. It's a futile trip without him. It's far too long, far too treacherous, far too difficult, and I don't know the way. Jesus is the way. And Jesus said he'll show you things that are to come. I don't know what tomorrow holds. He does. I don't know that today won't be the day of the rapture. And if it is, it'll be the Holy Ghost that has me praying through. 
I don't know that our economy won't be collapsed by this time a week from now or a month from now and we'll be, we'll be in dire needs. Uh, but the Holy Ghost uh, knows. And if I eat a bite during those days, it'll be Him that provides. If there ain't a doctor to go to, it'll be Him heals your body. You beat your head in vain against the proverbial brick wall. Nothing you've done has been able to win your spouse or win your child or win your loved one to the Lord. But he in one moment can convince them, can convict them. They could be on their knees praying when you get back home if he goes ahead of you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Won't ever forget at the close, I'm closing with this, the close of a service one night, I was at Somerdale preaching. I preached on the power of the Holy Ghost. He overwhelmed me so strong that I began to weep and sob, moaning or groanings which cannot be uttered. And I got down and laid on my face. I gave the altar call and I laid right there on my face. And I'm telling you, sobs and groans and travailing come out of me for probably 20 or 30 minutes. Nobody moved. Nobody said nothing. Nobody left. When I got up, the Holy Ghost told me, He said, you tell them somebody's going home the bad news but I've gone ahead of them he said I've prayed for them that their faith would not fail I think all of us were scared to go home that night and by the time I got everything turned off air conditioner, lights, locked it all up and could walk to the next corner where the church parsonage was my phone rang and there was a voice of a wife on the other end weeping and crying. It was me, Brother Eddie. It was me. He's gone. He's gone. My husband's left me. He's gone. And I said, take comfort in the fact that the comforter seen him when he packed up and left. It's not the end for you. Don't despair but take hope in that Christ has prayed for you that your faith won't fail. She said, what am I going to do if he don't come back? I said, you're going to serve God's what you're going to do. You're going to trust in the Lord. You're going to walk with God. You're going to make it to heaven by faith. That's what you're going to do. I'll never forget that as long as I live. Holy Ghost was wailing through me while that man was packing that vehicle up. He knows what's in your tomorrow. And he's preparing you for it in your today. I want to ask you, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? If the answer's no. I want to tell you, you need him. And I want to remind you that we all desperately need him. He's not a piece of luggage that I just pack up when I'm about to take a trip. I need him every day of my life. He knows who's going to run that red light right down the road. He knows who's going to blow through that four-way stop. If he's got to let your car break down until they do, he knows. Stand with me this morning. Father, I ask you today, this morning, for a divine visitation from on high. Now, the good Holy Ghost, this is not Pentecost Sunday. This is not any special event. This is us on a Sunday morning being reminded by your word, your gospel 
that in these last of the last days, we need the one who will show us things that are to come. We need to be baptized in his power. We need his wisdom. We need his joy. We need his peace. We need his ability to equip us to walk and be saints in these last days. Would you come and fill us, oh God, as you have so many times before. Oh God, would you let it flow from us, issue out of us like rivers of living water. Somebody on the job site is hurting. Somebody in our neighborhood is hurting. Some of our family members are hurting, oh God. May it issue out of our lives like rivers of living water. Would you meet me in the altar this morning? Let's ask God to just fill us and to refill us again and again.